Um, well, we have got uh, a great one here for uh, boxing enthusiasts and boxing fans who remember uh, Ali Frazier. I'm not sure who's Ali and who's Frazier, but we're going to have a good debate and a good conversation uh, today about ways to radically change um, our schools here in the near term and, uh, and medium term. Um, and so really pleased to have uh, Kaya and Reed. But before we get into the substance of it, uh, and their views about the way forward, I always love to kind of get a little personal and love to understand about what brought people to this stage and what made them interested in what we're discussing here today. And so, Kai, I would love for you first to tell us why uh, the linguist from Mount Vernon, who uh, got a degree at Georgetown School of Foreign Service, uh, decided to go into teaching and not only go into it, but stay in it um, and become chancellor um, when there's so many other things that you could have done. Sure. Um, I. I'm doing what I do because I got a great public education. Um, I come from a background that is very similar to many of the students that we teach. Um, my family lived in the projects in Mount Vernon, New York for 47 years. Um, my mother was a single parent, um, but she was the first person in our family to go to college, first person to buy a house, and she got a good public education, which took us from the lower class to the middle class. And I had a fabulous public education that um, then took me to Georgetown University and all over the world. And I know what can happen when children, black children, brown children, poor children, rich children, um, have a great public education. And that's why I'm here. Well, all right. And Reed Hastings has an interesting story, a son of a lawyer from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Many of you don't know that he was a top mathematician in college, twice winning prizes uh, before heading on to Stanford. Um, I think the most interesting thing, Reed, I read about you was as Reed went from engineer to starting his first company, twice he went to his board of directors, at least so the story is told, and said, fire me, I'm not good enough to become CEO. And they were smart enough to say no. And in less than four years, he took that company from startup to public and ultimately sold it. So with all of that, Reed, and even though we know that lots of successful entrepreneurs have uh, gotten involved in education, what specifically brought you, and what I think is interesting about your involvement, what's made you stay? Why are you on this stage today in 2011? I would have understood why you'd be on the stage in 2001 or 2003, uh, but why are you on the stage in 2011? Um, in 1982, Two, uh, the Peace Corps assigned me to be a high school math teacher instead of a fish farming aquaculture. Um, and if I had been in fish farming, I'm sure I'd be at the water conference right now. Um, an important conference to be sure. So I was a Peace Corps math teacher for a couple of years, great experience. Um, uh, came back, got into business. As Carlos said, I, I was fortunate to enjoy a bunch of success. And when I thought about giving back, it was the natural area for me because I had uh, about an inch deep of knowledge in it from having been a classroom teacher and started my journey. Uh, and along the way became uh, more and more passionate and convinced that this is a, a major area on a global basis um, to have high impact in. And uh, definitely uh, I'm inspired by people uh, like my friend Marian Joseph who's been working on education reform for almost 50 years right now. And I often tell my fellow reformers that uh, it's about staying in the game for a very long time is the key to making an impact. Well, well then you transition nicely to, uh, to the first question is, what's the road ahead? If we all agree that we may be in an inflection point and we all agree that we're hungry to see that not just you know, tip slightly, but tip all the way over such that lots of low-income kids all around um, the country really have, at a minimum, solid educations and hopefully first-class educations. What's the way forward in your mind? What are the two or three things as part of the Reed Hastings plan uh, that you think we can and should be doing to make that true? Well, I'd, I'd like to believe we're at some tipping point, but I, I, I don't see any evidence of that. Um, uh, so Aspire and KIPP and Race to the Top and all of that is good news, but still anecdotal in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I. You know, there have been conferences like this um, 
for 100 years in education um, trying to fix the system. And you know, the problems have been you know, different problems at, at different times. One of the most famous that uh, you know, all the audience knows is after Sputnik in 57. And there was a ton of conferences like this because we were losing the Cold War because we weren't preparing our math and science teachers, our educators, and public school system was letting us down. And uh, you know, that was a huge deal in 1957. And then in 1983, you know, it was basically an echo of that, right? And it was uh, another wave of discontent and rising tide of mediocrity. And, and now we got another wave and you know, so if you don't look at the history of it, you think, well, now is our time. I mean, that's good rhetoric, but you know, mostly what you've got is not much change, you know, over a very, very long time period. And so you have to wonder as a reformer, you know, are, are we treating symptoms instead of really the underlying cause? Because, you know, like I have a dermatologist friend and you know, he always likes telling stories about the rash and, you know, he says, you know, most people just put cortisone on the rash, right? And some of the time it goes away, and what gets interesting is when the rash doesn't go away. And, you know, it comes back again and again. And then, you know, with his great insight, you know, he figures out, uh, I don't know, you got a gluten allergy, and that's the real problem. And, I, and I, what I'm stuck with is we keep trying to, to fix school districts. And, you know, I, I was involved in a lot of the efforts in California a decade ago in Oakland and L.A. And, you know, there was some really substantial progress. And then it all went away. Um, and when you think about Houston when Rod Page was there, there was some really substantial progress. And then it kind of went away. Um, and what we see is school districts oscillate up and down over a decade. And it's a long enough period that if you're not in the game for a long time, you can mistake motion for real progress. And so, you know, look, there's 50, 100 large urban districts. At any point in time, there's a half dozen that are really doing great work. Certainly DC is one of those. The problem is you can't find any district that's done great work for 30 years in a row. It just oscillates. And so you have to ask, well, what's that? why is this different? I mean, other things, you know, in general, nonprofits are much better, churches are much better, the military is much better than 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. And the problem is really deep. The problem is elected governance, elected school board or elected mayor controlling the system. And so I've come to believe that all of our political bodies, school districts, that are governed by elections, whether that's mayor election um, or school board, are doomed to this cycle of change. And then all the things that we think of as a big problem, like the unions, a big problem, says Terry Moe, is a genius. But you know, it doesn't make sense to me, because the low union states, like Arkansas and Mississippi and Tennessee and Texas, they're not kicking butt. So how can the union be the real problem? I mean, the union's very strong in, in DC and New York. And you know, I'm not saying it, it's the union's not a rash. It is scratchy as hell and it itches. <laughs> but you know, it's just like not the fundamental issue. Okay? And, and what happens is if you look at it, on average, if you're a teacher, one out of three superintendents you work for are great. And two out of three suck. Okay? And so if you work in that system, you want a union too. And the unions is a symptom, not a cause. It's a manifestation of a protection because the management is not very good on average. Now why isn't that? Because it's an elected board. I mean, if you take a great company like General Electric, you know, been around 150 years, incredible innovation in all these ways, and you ask them and you say, what if your board of directors was elected by the general public? Okay, people who, you know, were board of Congress but couldn't get in the Senate and you got elected every two years. Well, you know, when you get elected to that, you would have chaos, because you get, don't get con continuity of vision. And the key form of governance we have outside of school districts are self-perpetuating boards. So all of you are probably on nonprofits. You pick the new board members. There's some new blood, but some continuity. For-profits work the same way. Not only that, but the church works the same way. Right? Cardinals pick the pope, pope picks the cardinals, you know, and it gives some flexibility in the system. It doesn't make it perfect, some flexibility. Uh, if you look at the military, each branch of the military selects their own generals. They're confirmed, but they're selected in their own branch. 
and you get this paradigm of self-perpetuating governance. And that keeps something, it gives it, doesn't, it's not a guarantee of excellence, but it's an enablement of excellence, because real excellence takes multiple decades, and it takes being sustained. And so I think what happens is, until we realize, wow, all schools in America need to be run by nonprofits with nonprofit self-perpetuating boards, we're doomed to being so excited about the work that Joel Klein did in New York, the work that Kaya has done in DC, that is really good for the decade we're in. But you know, over 40 or 50 years, you just don't see that continuity. And it's not their fault. They're working really hard. Okay, the, it's the problem is the school board where the mayor changes. And so you don't get a chance of sustained excellence. And so my work in backing charter schools is they're a form of nonprofit schools that have self-perpetuating governance and it gives them an opportunity for excellence. And many of you will know of Aspire schools which went through a transition because Don Shelby stepped down. And guess what, they picked a leader that was a whole lot big believer in the current things they're doing. That's normal in nonprofits. In school districts, that's not normal at all, okay? Whoever comes in is supposed to change things. Like, I accept it, so that's a great exception. Um, if you think of most school board members for big city districts, why did they do it? Well, it's a stepping stone to get to city council, and city council is a stepping stone to get to state assembly. And state assembly is a stepping stone to get to state senate or U.S. Congress. Okay, those are the those are the people that run, because you know it's not like when you serve on the board of a nonprofit, you serve at the local community center. You're like, yeah, if I do this well, I'm going to get on the Red Cross board. <laughs> you know, and so instead, you just try to serve that organization really well. Okay, and you focus on how to help that organization, and that's what nonprofits do. All right, Reed, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let Kaya jump in because. <laughs> I thought I had 40 minutes. <laughs> now, 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 Kaya, Reed has just said that Kaya, uh, Georgetown grad that she is, um, new teacher project, uh, Teach for America uh, pro that she is, is going to work super hard, is going to do some incredible things for a couple of years, and no one's going to remember it 10 years from now. And consequently, following her, as great as she is, is not the path to changing the lives of large numbers of, of kids all around the country. You agree? You disagree? That's just because Reed doesn't know me well. That's, <laughs> That's what we're here to fix. That's good. So um, I, I actually agree with the vast majority of what Reed is saying. Um, I see the oscillation. Um, I see the problem with the elected governance structure. Um, but I feel like there are other problems, and even if we were able to fix some of the issues that Reed raised, um, I, I feel like there are other issues that can also have a catalytic impact. Um, so first of all, I feel like, when I think about this problem, right, online banking, I, I bank with Bank of America, love it, because I never have to go into a building, right? I can do everything that I need to do on, Previously on my computer, now on my handheld, move money, pay people, pay people who don't bank at my bank, right? Everything, check my balance every day, get a text message, understand what's going on. We don't bank the way we banked 20 years ago. If I shop, I'm a big girl, you can't go to every store and get my size, right? I, I, can, I can find out who has my size before I go to the store. In fact, I don't have to go to the store. I can order it online. I can look at different stores. I go into Macy's, I want to buy shoes. They can click on a shoe and tell me if they have it in my size before they even go into the back of the thing. We don't shop the way we shopped 20 years ago. Um, we, don't have, we don't research the way we previously did. You had to go to a library. You had to sit in the library. You had to go to the right library to see if they had the books that you needed and whatnot. Now, the click of your device, the whole world is open to you. But school? we do the exact same way we did 20 years ago. The exact same way. Oh, we put smart boards up, but they're just blackboards, right? Because um, most teachers don't know what to do with them, but they have them. Um, and, and we are trying, I feel like what we've done in the, in the education reform movement is try to make schools better. How do we make what we are currently doing better as opposed to asking ourselves, how do we do schools completely differently? Completely differently. You don't even think the charter schools are, are asking that fundamental question? Some are, but I think most are not. Um, I think most, 
When I look out at the charter schools in Washington, um, we have a vibrant charter sector. And just like my schools, there are a handful of high flyers, there are a bunch of people struggling to figure it out, and there are a bunch of crappy ones. And we are spending money, and we're trying to all figure it out. But I, they don't have a lock, right? on success and I think what we've learned over the last 15 years is it's really hard to start a school and make it run really well. Talent is a huge issue. Is there enough talented entrepreneurial people who can do, it's the scale question, right? Last year, we were, how do you scale, blah, blah, blah. That's what the whole conference was about and I think we're off the scale question now and talking about innovation, talking about technology and how we use technology to do school differently. Talking about talent, 20 years ago when Wendy started Teach for America, people weren't concerned about the quality of the person in the classroom and now human capital, human capital, human capital, absolutely. Um, but part of getting the right talent in is changing the pay structure, changing, creating an environment where your best and your brightest want to come can feel some success and can feel impact. And I think that's what Reed is talking about when he says you know, that charters are these places where that kind of stuff can happen. Um, but I've seen a lot of really bad charters where that is not happening and they're just perpetuating the same thing that you know, my lowest performing schools are perpetuating. So I think we, gotta, we have to continue to think about the talent question. How do we attract different people um, into the field? Um, not just into classrooms, but into school districts, right? Before 2007, I would have never gone to work for a school district, ever, <laughs> ever. Um, and I was talking to somebody earlier and he was like, we need your people. How do we get the people who've come to your district to come to our district? And I was like, that's not the right question. The right question is, how do you inspire completely different people who would have never come to a school district to come to a school district? I want the 22 year old hacker people, right? I want them in my school district to help me think about how we completely revolutionize what's happening with our kids. Our kids are plugged in all day until they come into school and we ask them to unplug and pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and do what we've been doing for 20 years. And until we are able to think completely divergently about how school is, we have to think about time. Do you come into one building and sit all day and get everything you need? No, you don't do that in any segment of your life, right? So, so let me ask you this, at the heart of what you're saying, all the reimagining that, that both of you are saying is important, do you honestly think and you've got a particularly interesting situation because you've been in D.C., a place that tried to be uh, innovative, and you partnered with someone you partnered with for 14 years, both before and during D.C. Do you think that kind of bold reimagination and actual change can happen within a school system for a prolonged period of time? Absolutely. I, I mean, if I don't, I should give it up now, right? I could be doing much more exciting You could be running else. a charter school network. I, I could, but that's not what I want to do. <laughs> and, and here's, let me, let me, let me give you a, an example. So, you know, we, we piloted, um, or I guess we're pioneering in teacher evaluation, right? The, the architect of our teacher evaluation system is Jason Cameras. He was a Teach for America Corps member. He taught in DC public schools. He stayed in DC public schools for eight years. He became national teacher of the year. And he, when we came, when Michelle came to DCPS, she was able to galvanize lots of people who otherwise wouldn't have come. Jason joined our staff and completely designed this very different teacher evaluation system. That now I look across the country, saw an email today, Houston has a radically different teacher evaluation system. Not so much, but um, he never aspired to go run a charter school, work in a charter management organization, right? He wanted to fix the district because he spent eight years watching 47,000 kids right, go not the right way because the right people weren't in the district office. Right. So I think charters actually have a lot to teach us. And the promise of charters was increased autonomy, increased accountability, but also that we would create these places of excellence where there would be some sharing that would help the district improve. And I think we haven't remotely begun to unleash that. We're only starting. We've done some partnership schools in DC. Uh, we're working with one of our super high-flying um, charter schools, E.L. Haynes, um, Jenny Niles, to literally rethink how we move information um, to students, for parents, for teachers. 
Um, and that kind of collaboration and innovation based on what Jenny has been able to do at her one school and what we can now replicate across a bunch of schools is, I think, the sort of divergent thinking that starts districts going in a different direction. So let me see a class one question. Yep. If we're, I think we're in agreement about the goal of serving kids. Yes. Not saving districts. Absolutely. Okay. Saving districts, you can argue, is a good tool for saving large number of well, kids. Well, I, I mean, I'm a little agnostic, right? So we, I don't care. I, I, my, I, my, my goal is that every neighborhood in DC will have a high performing elementary school, middle school, and high school. I don't care if it's a traditional school, a charter school, whoever can do it the best. That's what I need, right? And I actually think that it's going to take both because neither the district nor the charters will have a, has a lock on quality or will anytime soon. So the reason that I would love you to run a charter network is because you're a revolutionary. You have vision, you have courage, um, you, you really know the area. And the difference I think you will find if you were to run is that you could build an institution that would last for 100 years. Okay, with your footprint, if you do a good job in founding it, running it, setting it up, because you would recruit a board for your, that believed in your organization, and whoever followed you would be very similar to you, mm -hmm. not very different. I'm living that. And, and, and that's the core difference, and so, but that, that is a huge difference to, to being sustained, because I would love to believe, it would be much faster if we could fix districts, but what no one can tell me is, well, what district got fixed 30 years ago and stayed fixed? No one can give you but, that. But, but what do you say to, to, to I hear two points that yep. she's drawing. One is which the world changes, so just because you can't point to that 30 years ago, doesn't mean that you know Netflix or the next Netflix can't start today. Amen. And then number two, I hear her saying that I hear her saying Amen. Appreciate that. Um, uh, but number two, you know, you got to get a word in because Reed will cut you out. But you know, but that's good. That's good. Let's just have that's a conversation. How, that's how you disrupt things. That's good. But then, but then, but then number two, what I hear her say interesting is that she says maybe there's a start of a brush fire here in that Michelle may have gotten pushed out, but. But she succeeded, Michelle, and so that there is some beginning of succession, even as a new mayor comes in, you know, contentious election. And so, does that hold any promise for you, or or does that remain the exception that proves the rule? Politics has been politics for five thousand years. Okay, as humans started to live in communities, this has nothing to do with the specifics of mayor or school district. This is about how to win elections. And I am so happy that Kaya stayed in, okay? And I really, uh, I think it's a fantastic coup, both to your overall acumen and to the respect uh, that, that people have for you. Um, but I think when I look at communities like Joel Klein's work in New York, and I think of Rod Page's work in Houston, when I think of Roy Romer's work, which many people in California worked on, I mean, really incredible, and it didn't last. And so I think it's deeper. I think the problem is the electorate, the people who run for election do that to make change, not to continue what's going on generally. But, 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 but let me ask you this, Henry, because I, I think yeah. it's so interesting where you're going with this. So, but, but, but is the real argument that, that in order to sustain change, what you need are not boards, what you fundamentally need the people, the populace, to fundamentally change their mindset, their expectations, such that they wouldn't stand for someone other than, they wouldn't have stood for Mayor Gray to appoint someone other than Kaya. And, and if you believe that that's the case, is that maybe the more important work that needs to be done, that you actually need more Michelle Rees, that you need more people who aren't just substantively changing things, but are literally in the political sphere very, um, aggressively and openly challenging mindsets and doing it for, you know, some period of time until, you know, perestroika breaks out. I think, you know, Michelle and Kaya's courage and what they um, have done for kids is fantastic, you know, period. Um, but I'm just trying to reflect on, you know, if you look over 50 or 100 years, we don't want to basically do the same mistakes that the people 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 years ago, you know, and, and they were working really hard and they had conferences just like this and they're really smart. We're not like the first smart generation or committed generation to try to create change. And as try as you hard, as try as hard as you are, once the politics in your community shift and someone else gets elected, the programs that, you know, you put in place don't stay. And if you look 
at every other, you look at Goldman Sachs, you look at the newspaper industry, you have multiple providers, you look at churches, the military, nonprofits, they get to select their, and develop their own leaders, and that keeps the continuity of vision. And you know, if Kaya could develop her board and pick her board, um, and then the board you know, assisted in picking the next head of, of DC Public Schools, that would be fine. We could call it a district, okay? Um, you know, but it operates like a nonprofit. Yep. That would be fine. So it's the political I, control that makes it unsustainable over multi-decades. So I agree with you, but I'll say two things, and you know, you've been here a little longer than I have, so you might be right. Oh, make but. fun of the gray. <laughs> oh, now I know I'm getting to you. Not at all. So two, two things, right? Um, mayor Fenty is here, who was our previous mayor. He hired Michelle Ree. And he said, how, how are things going? Things are going great. And uh, what I said to him, and what I, is really critical to understand in my success, I have unequivocal, I have the unequivocal support of Mayor Gray. The reason I have the unequivocal support of Mayor Gray is because Mayor Fenty provided Michelle with unequivocal support. That was something we've never seen before. Even in other mayoral control situations, I don't think we saw it as do or die, as Fenty did for Ree, right? So now we've created a dynamic where in DC, the mayor has to show that he is as unequivocal in his support for education as Fenty was, right? That gives me some operating room. Further, the city council chair wants to outdo the mayor, because that's always the tension, right? And so he wants to be the bigger education hero. And so literally, it's, Kaya, do you need more money? Kaya, what, what can I get you? Kaya, 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 right? And that is because we had one example. We previously didn't think that this was possible. We did not think that a mayor could have this kind of uh, complete and total devotion to one issue the way Fenty did for education. It has changed the dynamic in DC and allows me to operate in a very different context. So I actually believe that things can happen that actually change the fact that you know it was this way for 30 years. Secondly, um, I, I spent last night, I wasn't able to get here um, until this morning because I spent last night at Teach for America DC's first uh, annual gala. And a month or two ago, I was at Teach for America's 20th anniversary summit. And 11,000 people were in that room um, who have done Teach for America. And 20 years ago, right, nobody thought that you could get the best and brightest college students to choose teaching. 20 years ago, you never thought that these people would then go on to be superintendents, Congress people, all kinds of stuff. And literally, part of the change that is happening is because we literally changed the talent pool through one organization. If, raise your hand in this room if you are a Teach for America core member or have had some involvement with the organization. So, so I think that there are, meanwhile, right, I, I, one of my, we have a huge intern program in DCPS, right, because probably 40% of our work is fueled by interns. Nobody knows that, but it's good stuff. I, I, met, I met one of our former interns um, who is now a junior at Princeton. Um, when she was a freshman, I tried to hire her, I tried to have her not go back to Princeton for her sophomore year, because she was so good. Um, but she has now started Students for Education Reform, and they've got um, uh, chapters on all kinds of campuses. They're tricking out college students on education reform. This is the new hotness. People are best and our brightest, not just people graduating from college, people in college. Um, our best minds are now focused on education, and I do think that while you're right, we've only seen the oscillation and we've seen you know, the we're at risk, we need to do something over and over again, I have to believe that if we don't, we, we fail to take advantage of those other opportunities. And so I think my approach is, this is an opportunity that we can take advantage of and we either need to make it happen or not. We've failed to make it happen the last few times. A nation at risk, Sputnik, et cetera. But we have a different group of people who are engaged in this issue um, and I, I, I mean, I couldn't get up every day if I did not believe that we could do this. Reed, let me ask, let me ask, you, let me ask you about it, if we were able to move forward with the kind of charter schools uh, that you're talking about, two questions. One, how do you react to the fact today that there really is kind of a mixed record of success in charter schools? Um, and so how do you think about that to the extent that that's core uh, to the road forward? And then number two, you know, say more about what uh, the charter schools that really, you know, 
uh, uh, become the way forward, what they look like in, in your mind? I know you talked about the structure, but, but talk about other elements of it as well. Well, I totally agree with Kaya that I couldn't get up in the morning if I didn't believe we could do this either. Um, I just think that the do this is save kids, not save districts. Okay, and so where we're in agreement. I, so I agree, but I don't think that this is a, is it a district, is it a charter, right? To your point er, earlier, like how do we create great schools? And they're okay. not the schools that look like what we currently have. And so there might be a third way. There's districts, there's charters, there might, there's online education, and that might be the new newness. Like whatever it is, we have to figure it out. And I think we can't be bound by the constraints that you know, we currently know. We have to you know, think out the box, for lack of a better term. And okay. I'm not, I didn't come here to save a district, right? I came here because little black kids like me need a good education. And when they get one, they can sit on this stage and talk to people like you two, right? Yep. <laughs> I'm going with me. Hey, you got in on that. Uh, OK, so uh, and another place I think we agree is um, uh, TFA has been transformative. Um, and a kind of culture of excellence and, and intensity. And another thing that's on the edge of being transformative is technology, online learning. Um, whether that's uh, Dreambox, Research Mind, Mind Research, Khan Academy, there's just dozens of these sprouting with all different approaches. And uh, I think we would both agree that technology will rapidly accelerate. It's the promise of individualized learning um, that, that is the real promise. Um, and uh, you know, one of the reasons that Ar Alexander the Great you know, conquered the, the known world by the time he was, what, 32 or something, was because his teacher was Aristotle. You know, he had a one-on-one -on -one with Aristotle every day. <laughs> and you know, that's a heck of a teacher, right? Uh, so you know, that one-on-one -on -one education um, you know, is pretty important. And software, web-based, individualized, has that promise. Uh, to allow kids not to go at the rate of the class, but the rate of the individual. And, and I think this will be broadly transformative. It'll be both in charter and non-charter side. I think in general, charters will exploit it more aggressively because they don't have the same labor constraints um, that, that non-charter uh, has. Uh, but you know, both sides will, will profit. And, and certainly today, 93, 97% of the market is on the non-charter side than the, than the charter side. Um, so that's another area of great hope is, is how technology will improve learning. And that's not just a U.S. thing, because you know, often we get trapped uh, this, this stuff like, oh, the U.S. is falling behind. And I'm like, why do you care? I mean, you know, what about the kids in Brazil? You know, they're incredibly important human beings to all of us. And education, we should celebrate that Brazil is rocketing, that China is rocketing, and, and not get into the um, narrow, jingoistic, how are we doing compared to them? Uh, you know, we want every kid around the world to get a great education, and we're going to have a much better world if all of our economic competitors get a great education too. Um, and so, you know, that's where technology, so most of the work that you and I do is political and, and U.S. focused, U.S. system. But, you know, the work that the technology people in the room are doing is going to have really global impact, and, and that's really important. But, but Reed, say a little bit more, if you would, about some of the analysis and, and, and some of the experience that says that some charter schools, you know, that on average... Some charters suck, yeah. So no. A lot of them suck, or a lot of them suck, or, or average, that there aren't that many no, that you are know, distinctively right. better. So, so what I do couldn't you, believe what do you there's say a, to that, there's what's a, the road forward? There's a charter that um, I got to know a little bit, and about six years ago, uh, it was a, a, a lowest of the low in California, 1-1, one, one, for those of you that follow uh, the system. And uh, it went up for renewal, and it got renewed. I was like, how can this happen? And I knew some of the school board members. And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Do you know what happens, Reed, when you close a neighborhood school? There's a recall election. Why would we close the charter school? You know, I'm not taking that. I'm trying to get to city council. It was very eye-opening, OK? So the problem is, quote, accountability is really hard to administer because it's administered today in the charter model by the elected official who, who's very, if they're talented and if they're ambitious, their idea is not to piss people off. That's right. Their idea is to, to and so we need a, a new accountability mechanism. We just got a great bill. Uh, out of the California Assembly Education Committee. Uh, and what it does is basically give elected officials something to hide behind. And it says, if you're really low performing in California, local board can't renew you. You have to go to the state board 
And then after that, if they let you go, you come back to the local to get approved. And the state board is more removed from the politics in, in most states and can do a little better job. And so the, the key on the accountability is it hasn't worked because the people who try to win election have to administer. It's not fair to them, okay? And so we have to get that out. So think of it as, look, capitalism has gone through a while. Think of capitalism you know, before 1930, and there was no SEC. The SEC didn't exist, okay? There was a stock market, but no SEC. And then we learned a lot through the Depression, created an SEC, it gets a little better. Uh, and that's like this. We're in the second generation, third generation of the charter movement. We're starting to learn in different states how to do proper regulation. The other thing is that the good charters should be able to expand rapidly. And if you look at what's happening in New Orleans, it's incredible, because we're now at about 70% of the kids are charter. Now, of course, that doesn't really matter. Who cares if they're charter or not? The actual results, citywide, charter and non-charter are skyrocketing. And this is the only school district that was worse than DC 10 years ago. Okay, so, I mean, a phenomenal change. Now, because of Katrina, it's not really a clean, example, right? What we really have to do is get to 70 or 80 percent in a, a non-Katrina district, which is going to take some superintendent saying, the future for my district is to be mostly chartered, and I'm going to get the best CMOs in the nation into my district, because I'm going to give them buildings. And if you talk to a CMO leader and you say, I'm going to give you buildings, they're in. And so that is the key, is we got to get some people elected who believe in their legacy is to convert their district to be a bunch of CMOs, and that school district will, I think, replicate what happens in New Orleans and be a real example. And we gotta help you know, people like Kaya close the bad ones and give you the air cover. In, in Kaya's exact political jurisdiction, she doesn't do the closing, um, but in each, uh, each jurisdiction, it's a little different. So I, I disagree vehemently. Actually, I don't, but. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. But you know, he With gave the, the Fraser <laughs> Ali thing, right? Um, but but here's what I, I, I you know, we've we've brought charter management organizations into our district. They're managing some of our schools. In some cases, they're managing you know one of my worst high schools much better than we ever could. That's great. In another case, they sucked worse than we did, and I had to kick them out, right? But what I do think is right is that we have to create environments where people are free to do whatever they need to do for kids. And I actually believe that that can be created in a district. In fact, I think um, part of the problem is we believe in command and control, right? When you're in a district, everybody has to do the same thing. One size fits all, we buy one curriculum and everybody should do that, right? So we're adopting a, a new curriculum, we're rolling out a three-year academic plan and we are talking about do we, do we make everybody do this? Do we you know, let some people do it? Let some, what does autonomy mean? Is it earned, is it not? How do we make these decisions? And so I sit down with my instructional superintendents who manage all of my principals, and we have this little thing. Choose uh, A, if you want everybody to do this. Choose B, if you want people to be able to petition their way out of doing this. Choose C, if you want these things to just be guidelines and people can either deal with it or not. And choose D if you're good to just let everybody do whatever they wanna do. And so my superintendents all speak, and what do they want? A, command and control. Everybody should be doing the same thing. Why? Because that's an easy way for them to manage, right? That, that makes their lives easier. But, you know, they go through this whole thing and they ask me, what do you think? I said, fundamentally, I'm a D, but, um, I think C is where we need to be as a district. We need to say to people, these are the guardrails, and we need to set up accountability benchmarks that help us understand how people are progressing. The truth of the matter is, I don't care whether they use our stuff or not to get there, as long as they're able to demonstrate results. Oh my gosh, the crowd went wild, right? Because that's not what I'm supposed to say as a superintendent. I'm supposed to say, everybody's supposed to be doing this, right? So, you know, I say, look, C is where I really am. I, I care, I want to provide them with the resources that they need to be successful. I want to provide them with some parameters, but then otherwise I want to get out of their way. And I believe that we can create that kind of a dynamic within districts. I actually feel like some of the most innovative thinking that is happening in education right now is happening 
in school districts, in schools and in classrooms, except we don't let those people, we don't treat them as professionals, we don't provide them with opportunities to unleash their potential, we don't give them money to fund their new ideas. I mean, half of the charter operators are former district people who want to do something different. And I don't, I don't believe that you have to go outside of a district at this point. I feel like we should be able to create some kind of a structure where people who have great ideas and who have the ability to prove that they can deliver, that they can do that. I've got, I've got uh, one more question, then I'm going to go to the audience. So to the extent that uh, people have questions, there are a couple of, of mics here, and we'll probably only be able to take three or four um, questions. But if you do have questions, now is a good time uh, to get lined up. Uh, Kai, talk to me about the issue of race with, um, uh, in the uh, whole discussion of education reform. I feel like rarely do people talk about it out loud, but clearly in Washington, so D.C. Exactly, why not? <laughs> um, um, uh, but, but talk about it. Talk about, I mean, and I, I'm not asking you to see it if, if it's not there. And, and I'm, I'm clearly open if you say, you know what? That's it's an there. issue in a lot it's of places. There. I live in Washington, D.C. It is real. Um, I, I think that. Um, we have to get to this place where the quality of the education that we get is the most important thing. For years and years and years, um, little black children had white teachers and they were able to be successful. Um, I understand the, the importance of seeing role models. I also understand why in Washington, D.C., we previously had some of the greatest schools in the country because the best the smartest people in the black community only could teach. And so we had great schools and we were turning out great people. At the end of the day, um, I, I just believe that it takes all kinds. We live in a diverse society um, and we need all, our, te our children need to experience lots of different kinds of people. Um, you look at the Latino population and it will out eclipse us all very shortly. And if we don't teach our children skills to be able to deal with all different kinds of people, then we're doing them all a disservice. This world is becoming more and more global. And at the end, I mean, people in other countries are not talking about black and white, right? It's what languages do you know? Um, and there are certain languages like math and science that are universal. Um, and so I think, you know, we got to sort of get past that. That's my ideal philosophical thing. Um, but the real reality of it is who controls what and who tells who what to do. Um, and in Washington, D.C., you know, we have a history of being disenfranchised, of not being in control of our own thing, of Congress, you know, telling us what to do and how to do it. And that translates into white people telling black people what to do. And so um, there, is, there was tremendous... Um, I think excitement about me being a continuation of the work that I started with Michelle, but I would be a liar if I told you that um, part of the excitement about me is that I look like the kids that I serve. So it's easier for you to say the exact same things or at least to, to propose some of the exact same solutions that Michelle was proposing. Uh, because people can look at you and see the exact same person. Oh, I think yes. I, I'm also, I have a very different demeanor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I saw a broom back there. You don't have a broom? I thought you had a broom. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is real. Um, I think one of the most stunning things to me in my transition um, to the chancellorship is how people receive me in the grocery store, in, you know, in the gas station or whatever. And black people in Washington literally come up to me and say, we are proud of you. We are proud of you. Um, it is very, very moving. Um, but but what, is, what is that, uh, needless to say, I, I appreciate that, but, but, but what does that say to you about the opportunity for Reed or Michelle or a whole lot of the people in this room to contribute to. So it, it takes all kinds, right? I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Wendy Kopp and Teach for America, right? And people told her, you're a white woman from Texas, you don't know anything about urban and rural education. And literally, there would be no Kaya Henderson if there was not a Wendy Kopp. 
I mean, this is a complex issue. There's governance stuff, there's accountability stuff, there's talent stuff, there's curriculum stuff, there's facility stuff. There's enough for all of us to work on. And I think if we, I mean, there literally is a way for everybody to participate. And we have to understand that and be able to maximize that. Uh, Reed, you want to jump in on this? Anything on the, uh, that you've bumped into or that you think about when you, uh, uh, when you think about education reform, you think about race and, and how those do or don't come together? A famous guy said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And he was arguing in a letter from Birmingham jail that he did have standing in the community to address the issues. And the community is human beings, black, white, Brazilian, Chinese, Korean. You know, we're, we're in this together to make something important. Are human beings pretty tribal? Do they react differently to, to, with each other if they look differently? They do. And it's, you know, part of our inheritance our genetic inheritance. And it takes work to get over, and it takes work to be natural. But I think everyone in this room and everyone in the world has standing about the problems in the world and the problems of providing an incredible education to children. And we just have to be aware that race is a very real issue. It you know, definitely gets swept under the table. But it also is not an issue that you suddenly then, if you're white male, you suddenly can't talk about or can't deal with. You have to acknowledge, you know, what I really know about race, you know, can fit there, mm -hmm. okay? But as long as you're aware of it, you can still find roles and be effective um, in that. And so I think it is a, a broad community. Yeah, I mean, I also think that when you ask white parents what they want for their kids, they want their kids to be successful in life. When you ask, ask black parents what they want for their kids, that you know, we all want the same thing for our kids. And I think we have an important piece of the work is drawing out those commonalities because we're much more similar than we are different. Um, I'm gonna go right here. Sir, will you give us uh, your name and, and direct a, a, a quick question? And I'm sorry we don't have more time, but uh, would love to get a question. Uh, my name is Anil Amajani, company is Big Universe Learning. Um, so I, I come from like 20 years of enterprise software and you know, I sold a company and I wanted to, I got drawn into education, wanted to make a difference. And what I started discovering is like layers and layers of bureaucracy, right? And it's just like, it couldn't be harder to bring innovation into education, right? Um, and like, for example, every state has, the, the, you know, different buying patterns, every, you know, there's some by school by school, some by district by district, and then there's unions, and then there's this and that, basically. Um, it's almost like it's like, designed to shut out innovation. I mean, I read somewhere that the only industry that uses less technology than the education industry is the coal mining industry. Um, coal mining does a lot of technology. Have you been <laughs> a coal mine? <laughs> so, um, it's incredible. No, so Clean I, coal. <laughs> so I guess I almost feel like it's an upside down pyramid where the students are way at the bottom and th we're doing all of this for them, but they were getting the least amount of attention. All the other stuff, you know, is all this bureaucracy. So my question to you is, what are your ideas on like innovative thinking? You know, how can we turn this, you know, upside down and really put like the emphasis on A, the students, because those are the ones that we're trying to prepare for the life and careers and all that, and B, the teachers, because to me, teachers are really important. Now what I'm hearing with like, you know, no offense, I mean, Reed's got a lot of experience. I, I agree with a lot of stuff on the politics, getting the politics out and all that, but when I hear charter schools and then, Kai, I mean, I hear districts, I mean, to me, it's still buildings and bureaucracy, you know, one way or the other. It's like, how do we do something really innovative, like whether it's web-based learning, individualized learning, something, you know, I just want to hear your thoughts on what do you see as like, you know, changing this 20-year-old thing that you were talking about. I mean, model. you gotta unleash talent, right? All of our best thinking comes from great people. And one, you need to ensure that great people are in school districts, because that has not been the case. Two, you have to ensure that those people believe fundamentally that we can make this happen for kids, because there are a lot of people in school districts who do not believe that. But then you have to create these zones where people have the time, the resources, to bring big ideas to life, right? So New Schools Venture Fund incubates new businesses, right? They let those people, they got fellows, they are paid, I guess, for a year or something to come up with good ideas. Nobody is allowing teachers to sit around and come up with good ideas. 
they know probably better than any other. So one of the things that we're thinking about doing in DC is raising a junk of cash and allowing teachers to compete in sort of a case study way to create an innovation fund where if you have a great idea that will fund that idea for our teachers. And if you can demonstrate results in student achievement, then we'll scale it, right? How do you create those kinds of opportunities for the people who have some innovative thinking? In fact, we tamp down innovation in school districts, and we got to change that. Reed, you want to weigh in? God bless the brave soldiers of Navy SEAL Team 6 and the wonderful dog that accompanied them. And wait a minute. Navy, that's the boats. Well, what is the Navy doing in the high mountains of Pakistan? Oh. oh, you know what it is? The Navy doesn't really do boats. The Navy does military soldier preparation, just like the other branches. And in fact, what the US government has done is to say, let's have separate branches, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, because then they compete and for sometimes a whole decade, like after Vietnam, the army got broken. And what happens is the other branches take over the mission. So the different military branches compete vigorously with each other for missions. And right now, the Navy SEALs are at the top of the pack. And you can bet that the army rangers are learning. And they're going to catch those bastards. Okay? And it's that separate innovation. They each get to promote their own leaders and separate innovation and copying each other's ideas rapidly that promotes progress. And the reason we don't have progress in our politicized school district system is because it doesn't work like that. They don't get to control their destiny. They're controlled by political elections. It all comes, the deep problem is that electoral control. And the solution is to move all the schools, all the public schools, to be nonprofit public schools and we will have as competitive as churches are with each other, as competitive as military branches, as competitive as nonprofits, the way Berkeley and Stanford compete. I mean, you know, they don't kill each other, but they're vigorous in their competition. Political, and, politically, how would you make that happen? Is that something you think that has to happen at a national level? Is there a breakthrough on a state level? And why isn't that, it happening in the places where there's deep charter penetration? Because we don't see that competition. Um, well, one thing is you own all the buildings, so the charters are at a definite deficit. But in the places like New Orleans, where the buildings are handed out equally by a relatively neutral force, um, it is absolutely happening. Both the, the few district schools and the charter schools are growing, and the overall schools and scores in New Orleans are rising rapidly. It's been a phenomenal success story. And you know, we talk about innovation. For a charter school, they don't try to close the achievement gap. They want to reverse it. Okay, and schools in San Jose, you know, 100% Latino, 80% EL, KIF, rocket ship, numerous schools, they're outscoring your kids in Palo Alto now on math scores. Okay, they're outscoring them by two very different approaches. KIF's approach is I will work you to the bone and you will love it. Okay, <laughs> and rocket ship's approach is I love computers, sit in the lab and learn. I mean, very different approaches, and they're both getting, and there's more, and you know, I know the local examples, but across the nation, this is happening. Is it small? Yes, okay? Uh, is it uh, need a lot of work? Yes. Do we need to get to the second generation of governance? Yes. Is it a panacea? No. Is it gonna take 30 years? Yes. Would 30 years to change America be a record short time? Yes. Um, next question. We have, time for, we have time for two more, so I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to go there, and, and then we're going to say gracias. Um, my name is Kareem. I'm not going to say where I'm from, just to make it clear that this isn't a plug. Um, so let me just ask a quick question. Raise your hand in this room, because you did this for TFA. If at some point in your educational trajectory, let's say middle school math, you asked, why am I learning this? Let's break it down. Right. Education starts with society saying there's something we want our kids to know. Right? That's the ground level. And then it's we need somebody to do that. And then it's now we need somewhere for that to happen. It strikes me that in conversations like this, I mean, you guys are definitely talking about charter schools, but just in conferences like this, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money focusing on stages two and three while we're treating stage one as a standard. 
right? So take Rise of Iran, put that on, I, on an iPad. Is that going to change anything? Take Rise of Iran and very algorithmic, kind of irrelevant types of teaching that kids hate and put that in a charter school. Is that going to change anything? Why aren't we having the conversations around what are the questions that get asked? Reed, you bring up Aristotle, right? Aristotle was taught by Plato. Plato was taught by Socrates. Socrates is known for the questions that he's asked. But I feel like in this room, if Socrates walked in here, we would say, how do we scale Socrates? And then two years later, we would confuse the iPad for Socrates. So to your point, Reed, about we keep having these conferences every year, every year, are we talking about, are we talking about calamine lotion? Right, or are we talking about the rash? That's a good question. What do you think, Reed? <laughs> Someone to silence me. Yeah, no, no. Uh, it, like it is. You know, yeah. it, if you think about what education is going to be like in a hundred years, it's unimaginable. It is going to be phenomenal. Um, think of the most wild uh, PS3 or Xbox game you've played with immersive Connect stuff and make that go like times 50. Uh, and you know, that'll be an education experience in 100 years. But today, we got practical problems. And so I think Kai and I are both focused and trying to be focused on these practical problems of um, how do we make it better than it is today? Um, and, and one approach is certainly working in school districts, and that's great. And another approach is growing the charter school segment, and that's great. And Kai's been super helpful on that. Um, and I think that they both are, are moving the ball forward. Can I, can I hit you with a little bit of a tough question before I answer? If a friend of yours said, Reed used to be a revolutionary, and now he's an incrementalist who's OK with something taking 30 years and calls that revolutionary, you would say what to that? Well, I think uh, Jeannie Allen said to me about 10 years ago, oh, God, Reed, you are just like a hopeless moderate. <laughs> That's not that uh, sexy, but okay, and, all right. And I thought, no, it's true. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm looking, how do we grow the charter movement by one percentage of kid per year? That would be a phenomenal success. These things take 30 years for any real change. Look but, at, but even in a world in which people like Joel Klein, who you said you admired his work, you know, writes an article and says, if anything, I wish I had been more aggressive. You, you, you still say it's okay to, and, and Dr. King, who you wrote about, you know, uh, wrote about the tranquilizing drug of gradualism, you know, wrote about, you know, the risk of incrementalism. So even in light of that, you, you still say just the reality on the ground is you got to take 1% a year and add it up to? Uh... Well, think of the charter reputation. You know, in this conference, like most people think positively in charters. But, you know, if you talk to general educators, they don't aspire to go run CMOs. They go to run districts. Um, and what we have to do is, on the charter side, um, is serve kids so well that ambitious people, when they're 28, 29, they're an assistant principal, um, that they say, you know what, I'm going to go start a CMO, and it's going to be better than anyone I've ever seen. It's that entrepreneurial energy. We don't, we don't haven't yet done that. We've got very few people who have crossed over from the district side to the charter side. Um, and some of it is branding, some of it has been, you know, bad rhetoric on the charter side. And so, no, I don't think it's a revolution. I think, you know, we're going to steadily make progress, um, and we're going to learn a lot on the way, and, and, and Kaya and I will both be in it for 50 years. 50 years, no, we will not. Um, <laughs> you, yes, you, you might, will. You might, yes, you I, will. I, I will not. You will. Um, so I, I actually feel like incrementalism is not the worst thing in the world, right? Like, there was an iPad 1 before there was an iPad 2, right? Like there were, there was a big computer in a room before there was any of that, right? So there is an iterative process that happens. Um, but, but, but you know some people would push back when they hear you say that, and they would say that the difference between no iPad and iPad was the revolution. And then once you had a revolution, then evolution's okay. Except but, before you got to the iPad, there was an iPhone, and before there was an iPhone, there was right like there. I mean, you could, you could, you could, you can is, trace this, is, this, this is back, easy right? and true. Yes. And and I think that that has to happen here, right? But we're incrementalists. Even our most revolutionary people are incrementalists. So rocket ship, love them, Preston, my boy, right? They are doing it. And I'm like, okay, great. So I need you in DC, and they're like, eight schools. I can give you eight schools. I got 123, come on. Well, but we have to. And I'm like, okay, so wait, right? Like, you are doing one of the most revolutionary things in education. And I can appreciate you want to do it absolutely perfectly. Wait, right, right now you'll give them eight but buildings? I, 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 listen, 
I'm supposed to be meet careful. with John Are Dan. Are you going to yes. give them eight Yes. I, I mean, I called them. Preston, where you at? Can you testify? <laughs> I called them. At DC I funding in eight them. buildings, we have a deal. I called them and said, hey, listen, like, how can we do this? Because I do not believe that we can continue to stand up a teacher in front of a classroom. I believe technology, uh, the way they do it, I believe gaming, I believe, I mean, sky is the limit, right? And I want DC to be that district where we are seeding the most innovative things. But if I can't get the freaking innovators to come, well, what am, what am I supposed to do? Wait, if you give them their bellies, I will give them enough of a donation to do it. Let's Whatever do it. it takes. Yeah. My dad, my dad says always leave them wanting more. So we got a deal, we have good stuff. Uh, we're gonna allow Ted Mitchell to come up and wrap us up. But before we do that, let's literally give a hand for two innovators, two change agents.